The biblical text says that the purpose of the Babel structure was to prevent the people from being scattered abroad in contrast to God's commands. In other words, the verse describes an urbanization project. I think he puts it so well. Describes an urbanization project to keep the population together around a single administrative complex with a temple at its center. This urbanization process contributed to the deification of human rulers who maintain control, note the word control, over the city and so you have a cult forming here and so notice the parallels to no new new thing under the sun here you have a tyrannical control operating on the basis of fear we only have two worldviews either the genesis one and two or genesis three genesis one and two we have a whole tradition there we also have the pagan model there with continuity of being the key takeaway here for our purposes is notice the creator-creature distinction. On the left side of the chart, we have two existences, the existence of God and creatures. You don't violate that distinction. You don't mix gods and men. God is God and men are men. Yes, there are divine counsel and angels and all that, but they aren't God. They may be called gods, plural, but God is God above all gods. You have man and nature. These are everlasting distinctions. On the right side of the chart, if, and this is Satan's lie to Eve, that the word of God is not authoritative, and if you just eat that tree, you can have divine knowledge. And in this side, nature is all there is. There's no two, two existences. There's no creator-creature distinction. It's just nature. Well, nature then means everything. The gods, nature, man, angels, everybody is all part of this continuity. And that means there are no hard and fast barriers to transforming from one to the other. And I see right here that this pagan thing has taken us over now with transgenderism and everything else because boundaries don't matter anymore. It's not whether you're a man or a woman. It's not even whether you're an angel or a man. It's all one nature. And that comes out of Genesis chapter 3. So that's the basic theological background of Babel. And so... How, what, what's the defense of the people? The, if there were believers at Babel, and there must have been, what were their sources of information from the word of God? Well, we know God two ways. And again, that's been mentioned several times here. One is the universal sense of deity. And we have God consciousness or sense of deity. And here is Dr. Oliphant uh, at Westminster talking about the universal sense of deity. Now, this doesn't save, but it renders us responsible. We know God not because we have reasoned our way to him or have worked through the necessary scientific procedures or have inferred his existence from other things we know. We know him by way of revelation. We have the sense of deity because we are God's image and because as image, God implants a knowledge of himself within each of us. Paul regards SD, talking now about Romans 1, that passage we've mentioned several times in this conference, regards SD as knowledge itself that comes directly and repeatedly from God through the things of everyday life. So that's one way. Now that doesn't tell us the gospel, but it renders us responsible. Now, we also know that people after the flood knew parts of the word of God. And so in addition to the sense of deity is the, what I call the Noahic Bible. And we have evidences of this. Here is a Christian couple, also a Chinese person guided them. They went into the most ancient symbols of China and they were oracle bones. And so, interesting, you go from left to right. Uh, there, there's a symbol for create, and then there's a, that's a conglomeration of, of dust, a mouth, a breath of life, 
and then they combine talking and walking. It's a living person. Maybe more clear is the one for happiness. Happiness equals one mouth in a garden with God. Now, where did they get that information? If they knew this after the flood, the people at Babel obviously knew it. Righteousness equals a lamb and me. Boat equals a vessel and eight people. Now, that's pretty specific. And it's embedded in the earliest. China is a continuous, it's create, it's a continuous society for, for centuries and centuries and centuries. So my conclusion here is that the people at Babel, even if they suppressed Seth, even if they put down the Noahic covenant, they knew something about it. And there's another source, amazing. Dr. William Schmidt wrote in 1930s, he, did a, he was a Roman Catholic monk who was trying to refute the idea that monotheism evolved from polytheism. So what he did, he did an experiment. He went into primitive tribes that had remained isolated from civilization, so they weren't contaminated with whatever was going on in the society around them. Here's what he says. Comparing primitive cultures with the later ones, we may lay down the general principle that in none of the latter is the supreme being to be found in so clear, so definite, vivid, and direct form as among the peoples belonging to the latter. We can establish the supreme being's existence among all pygmy tribes in the Asiatic and the African groups for the Negritos on Philippine Islands. Father Benefor has discovered a nocturnal liturgy addressed to the supreme being and couched in a sacred language no longer intelligible to the natives themselves. In the primitive cultures of the Arctic, the supreme being is everywhere recognized and worshipped. He appears among the three groups of primitive whose culture is related to the Arctic regions. In particular, the idea of created ex nihilo is known. A belief in the supreme being is an essential property of this, and the most ancient of human cultures, which must have been deeply and strongly rooted in it at the very dawn of time. And of course, we would say the post-flood situation. So that's the positive side. And what we're trying to do here is visualize what were the people in Babel thinking when this happened. And we go and we get back into what Dr. Price said about those ziggurats and the fact that they, the, the people, the king, was the mediator. What does that sound like? A political leader who claims to be the mediator between heaven and earth. Isn't that a counterfeit of something? A counterfeit of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a, an antichrist. And here's a picture. Frankfurt was an Egyptologist at the University of Chicago years ago, and he has this in his book. The Egyptian state is not a man-made alternative to other forms of political organization. It was God-given, established when the earth was created. The word state was absent from the language because all the significant aspects of the state were concentrated in the king. He was the fountainhead of all authority, all power, all wealth, the famous saying of Louis XIV, Le Gat, Saint Moi, was levity and presumption when it was uttered, but it could have been offered by Pharaoh as a statement of fact in which his subjects concurred. That particular temple in Frankfurt's book, he explains it. That name, the, the Egyptian hieroglyphics there, is the name of Pharaoh Sahur. And on the right, you see what looked like vertical lines. They're actually scepters. So that is a picture of his power, his scepters. Up above is the symbol of heaven, and down below is a symbol of earth. So here you have the mediator. So what we're saying here is, here's the ancient distortion at the beginning of our civilization of turning the state into a religious thing. And it's a pagan religion at that. 